Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. My name is Craig. I'm a senior pastor here and it is our privilege to have you with us as I arrange all of these things up here. Excuse me just for a minute. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Matthew in just a second. Matthew chapter 5. We've been there for a few weeks and we'll be there all the way until Easter. One thing that I want to mention that I have failed to do regularly recently. Pastor Adam says it every Sunday, uh, but we're not doing a good job. And by we, I mean you. Um, um, if you are a guest with us and you've never filled out one of those little guest cards, I need you to do that for me. It would really be amazing. Uh, if you don't want to do it right now on that little piece of paper, that's fine. Just pull your phone out. We'll all think that you're checking Instagram or that you're sending somebody a text message. Uh, and you can do it at malvernhill.org slash connect. But if you will do that, that really helps us out. Um, the Super Bowl is tonight. I've got to get food ready at my house. I'm not going to come and visit you. I promise I'm not coming to your house today. I just want to know that you were here so that we can just reach out to you and, and let you know uh, how grateful that we were to have you with us. All right. Hopefully by now you've made it to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of God's word and I'm going to go against my, my promises to you. I told you that we were just going to be reading one verse per week, um, but we're actually going to read... Y'all, the, the pages in my Bible keep sticking together. I don't know who's sabotaging me. Um, but uh, we're going to actually read three verses this morning because they, they play into one of the points I'm going to make in just a minute. So we're going to read verses 3 through 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for loving us and thank you for this word that never fails. I pray, Lord God, that you'd move among us as we consider what it looks like to be gentle. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. So we've been working through this sermon series on the Beatitudes for several weeks. Well, this is the third week in this sermon series. And like I said, we'll be here until Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter, uh, if you're not aware of that. And so beginning on Palm Sunday, we will look at the Sunday, uh, what Palm Sunday is, is Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. Uh, and then on Easter Sunday, of course, we will do the, uh, the, the resurrection story of Jesus. If you are a longtime member here at Malvern Hill, if you've just been with us for a little while, you don't know this, but historically we've done a sunrise service on Easter Sunday, and we're not going to be able to do that moving forward just because of the two services. There's just not, uh, we're not able to pull that off. So you're welcome to come to both services for Easter. You can come to the 830 and the 10, whatever, what time is it now? 11? I don't even know. Um, but uh, they will be identical services this year, which is a little different. But I'm excited about it. We're going to have a big uh, um, praise choir that's going to be helping lead Easter service. Let me tell you about some great things that are happening in your church. Uh, there's so many of y'all around here that uh, this is what it looks like. Our average attendance in the month of January is the attendance that we had at Easter last year. That's, that's how much we were growing. Uh, man, we had one person clap in the first service and one in the second. So the rest of y'all need to get on board. I appreciate that. It's good to have happy people. Thank you, Adam. Um, it is. It's good stuff, man. The Lord's doing great things. We had somebody else join in our, in our first service. Folks are coming to the Lord. We had a youth service, uh, youth conference this weekend with um, a bunch of teenagers here. And what's even, I, I think, even more awesome, I believe, is not just that there were teenagers here. Uh, there were adults that just kind of kept showing up to do all kind of things and to help from... Uh, from our youngest adults to our oldest adults and everybody in between showing up to make, make a difference. Um, but that's what's coming up around here. But back to the sermon. Y'all are curious about why in the world I got there. Uh, we're going to be in the Beatitudes up until Easter. That's how we started on that. That's how my ADD works, so I do apologize. What we've looked at so far, though, is, is blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. And today we're looking at this, this Beatitude of, of meekness. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. And the reason I read all three of those, as we're going to see in just a minute, is we can't fully embrace this idea of meekness until we've embraced the other two. Until we've understood what it is to be poor in spirit, we've understood what it is to mourn over our own sin. We can't embrace meekness. But meekness, or being meek, that's one of those Bible words anymore. It's not a word that's popular in, in our common uh, culture today. And so it's, it's helpful if I maybe explain what meekness means. Meekness really is closely related to the word gentleness. And, and so when we think about meek, you're thinking about gentle or humble. The meek person is not, <laughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. For those of you watching at home, you're welcome. Because that was probably loud on your TV. Um, 
apologize for that. The meek person is not self-serving. The meek person is not looking for what they can get. The meek person is quiet and submissive. D.A. Carson describes meekness this way. Meekness is a controlled desire to see the other's interests advance ahead of one's own. Now look, this is not a personality trait. So this is not the same thing as niceness or shyness. Meekness is more of a disposition. Uh, Meekness is that thing that any of us who are followers of Christ can and should aspire to. And we should aspire to it because Jesus tells us to. Jesus doesn't just tell us to when he describes himself in Matthew chapter 11, 29. And I believe this is the only place in the Bible where Jesus tells us his heart. He says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. That word gentle in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 is the same Greek word that's translated as meek in Matthew 5, 5. So in other words, Jesus says, I am meek, I am gentle and lowly in heart. So not only does Jesus command us to be meek, Jesus himself is gentle and meek. And as a result, what he's ultimately telling us to do is to be like him. Now, in addition to this idea that Jesus gives us these commandments, I do want to sort of dispel with something that some of you may already be assuming. And and it's this thought that the Beatitudes are those commandments that Jesus gives to like the super Christians. The Beatitudes are those expectations that God gives to pastors maybe, but this is certainly not what God would expect of, say, I don't know, uh, a politician or a football coach or a drill instructor. And yet, the Bible doesn't give us these way outs. Jesus writes right here in Matthew chapter five, verse, or excuse me, Matthew five, Matthew writes about Jesus. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountains, and when he sat down, he said to them, this is how you can be the most excellent super Christian of all time, and nobody else could aspire to be just like that. That's not at all what he said, is it? The Bible says instead that Jesus went up and he sat down and his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them. The disciples that came to Jesus in this particular place was a mixed multitude of his disciples. So he had the 12, his apostles, who were his closest group. But in there mixed in was also this larger group of of followers who followed Jesus from a greater distance. In other words, there's not exceptions given in these Beatitudes. And so when he says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, the expectation is that you, no matter what, what your season of life is, no matter what your position or situation in life is, the expectation is that you are to be meek. And if you're not, you're not following Jesus biblically. There's just no room for arrogance among God's people. This morning, I want us to see three things from this passage of Scripture. And I do want you to know this is a difficult passage of Scripture to preach. It's difficult to preach because, just to be totally honest, who really likes being meek, right? Matter of fact, one of our teenagers was by the church earlier this week, and uh, she said, Pastor Craig, what are you going to preach this week? I said, I'm preaching blessed are the meek. I said, I'm kind of dreading it. This isn't an easy passage to preach. And she said, well, somebody's got to. It might as well be you. So there we are, guys. Somebody's got to. Might as well be me. And we'll get through this together because this is a commandment that Jesus has given to us. Number one this morning, if you're going to be meek, you've got to be honest about who and what you are. You've got to be honest about who and what you are. We, we, we can't sort of embrace humility Unless we're willing to look in the mirror and say, well, I'm able or I'm unable to do these particular things, right? Uh, There's got to be an alignment of reality with my vision of myself. Now, part of that is this. We got to be honest about what you can and can't do. So when I'm talking about being being humility, I can't speak very clean. When I speak about meekness or being meek or being gentle, some of this is going to come about as a result of my willingness to acknowledge what I can do. So this isn't like a fake humility, right? I don't see somebody call and say, can you come help me move this couch? And I just go, oh my goodness, I could, but I just, I, I, I feel so overwhelmed. I, I, you're far too good for me to come and help you do something like that, you know? 
It's not like that. This isn't somebody that says, could you pray over me? And you go, oh my goodness, I, I'm not worthy to approach you and do something like that. Being honest about what we can do and then walking into it, right? This isn't a willful ignorance. I don't choose to not know anything. I want to do it. But I also got to be honest about what I can't do. One of the things I've learned recently over the last 6, 8, 12 months, I preached a little bit about anxiety up here just a few weeks ago, but I've, I've had to learn to be honest and okay with the things that I can't do. And sometimes the things that I can't do aren't necessarily things that I can't do physically, right? Or things that I can't do intellectually or things I can't do because I don't have the skill set. Sometimes it's just because I can't do it because I just don't have the time. Remember what I said? There's a lot of y'all. Y'all keep showing up. And as a result, my time keeps getting stretched further and further. I celebrate all of that. But what it's meant is that I've had to be willing to say no to things. I've had to be willing to say, hey, I can't do everything. Everybody on staff is looking at me with judgment right now because they know how, how hypocritical I sound if I'm not careful because I don't do very good at that. I like to just step in. You call, can you do this? Sure, I'll be there tomorrow. When, when do we start? And yet I can't. That's a part of me acknowledging that. But it's, it's not just about sort of being honest. i got to be realistic about these weaknesses and flaws. Part of humility, though, or excuse me, of meekness, though, you ready for this, is not just that I'm willing to be honest about it, but I get to a place where I'm okay with others being honest about it. I, I, I don't know if you've ever looked in the mirror and you said, man, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. And, and you deal with that. But what do you do when somebody else comes to you and says, man, you're a dirty, rotten sinner? I preach most every week. Um, and uh, matter of fact, this sermon, this sermon right now is going to be significantly different from one earlier this morning because something didn't go the way I wanted it to. Um, and so in every sermon I preach, I have an opinion when I finish the sermon as to how it went. And I either think it went well or I think it didn't go well. Yesterday I preached um, for one of the, the, the sermons for our youth conference yesterday afternoon. Honestly, I thought I hit a home run. I thought it was a phenomenal sermon, to be honest with you, right? I, I left, I, I feel like I did a good job. I looked at Wyatt, my oldest son. I said, hey, bud, how'd you feel the sermon went this afternoon? He said, I'd give it about a five. I said, out of like 5.2, you know? He said, no, dad, uh, it was fine. It was, quote, it was mid. Really? That's what I get. So I go to my, my youngest daughter, my little angel, the one that thinks I can do no wrong. And she went for a walk with me last night. And so I get her, like, I, I get her all like loosened up. We're out walking. She's been talk, talk, talk. And then I, I slide in and I say, hey, baby, how did you think the sermon went this afternoon? And she goes, eh, it wasn't your best, honestly. It was okay. <laughs> Man, you know? I mean, it's one thing when I say it was a bad message. It's really hurtful when somebody else says it. We sit in our staff meetings on Tuesdays and our, our pastors look at me and they say, hey, it was good or it was bad. But then they start to get really specific. Why did you say that? Last Sunday they said, why did you use such a long illustration? You know, I mean, this is what happens with it. It's a lot harder. Meekness is not just saying I am, but willing to hear it when others say you are. To accept it. To respond with gentleness. To be honest enough to be Open when others see your weaknesses and your flaws. Okay? The second thing is I want you to seek progress in the Christian life. So be honest about who you are, but seek progress. Now, I, I told you that we can't get to meekness until, until we first cover the other two things, okay? Um, we can't become meek or gentle until I've first done what? Been poor in spirit. And then I've been willing to mourn over my sin and the sins of others. Okay? But then once I get there, I can't stop. Now, G.K. Chesterton once said this about um, humility. He described meekness or humility this way. He said that we need to be confident in the truth and doubtful in ourselves. Unfortunately, in our society, we've begun to be confident in ourselves and doubtful in the truth. We've begun to embrace willful ignorance. And as a result, we lose a whole lot of what meekness actually is. We, we cease to be gentle because I am so confident that I know everything that anything that you bring to the table that contradicts me must not be true. 
Just this week, I was interacting with a guy about a paper that he wrote. It was actually a dissertation that he wrote. And uh, the message I sent back to him after I read it, he'd asked me to do some review work for it. The message I sent back to him was, I didn't really like the data. It didn't fit with what I would like to have seen, but I think it's pretty good work. In other words, I... I wasn't really pleased with what the facts had to say because they didn't fit within my particular desires. But guess what I don't get to do? I don't get to change the facts just because I don't like them. Right? We've got to be willing to take this truth at face value, and if we're going to question something, we question ourselves. That's progress in the Christian life. But part of progressing in the Christian life means that we've got to keep taking step after step after step. I begin to study, I begin to grow, I begin to understand. And y'all, once I begin to draw closer to Jesus, I begin to grow in humility and meekness. I walked into a gym one day, about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I had my gym bag, ran to the locker room to get changed. And as I walked into the locker room, I encountered something I did not expect to see. There was this mountain of a human being standing in there. Um, and he was absolutely monstrous. He was a professional bodybuilder. He was standing in there practicing his poses in the mirror. And uh, this is just like one of those locker rooms, just like a big room, like a big room, right? Nothing in there except me and him and air. And there's this giant human whose arms are bigger than my legs, and I realize I'm supposed to change my clothes in the presence of this I suddenly felt really insecure. I walked in feeling excited about that lift I was going to do today, and I walked out of that locker room feeling like a very small human being. You understand? So sometimes our, our, our humility is impacted by our, 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 our station in life. Y'all, some of you haven't grown in humility or in meekness or in gentleness because you've not grown in your understanding of who Jesus is. And you've not grown in your understanding of who Jesus is because you've chosen willful ignorance. Look, theology doesn't teach you the practical. It teaches you about a person. There's some people that go, well, Pastor Craig, you do all that study and that reading, but I just want to do the stuff, you know? You do the learning, and I'll just do the things. Here's the deal. When we learn about who this God is, it changes who we are. Our primary objective in life is to draw near to him. And when we draw near to him, we begin to discover that he is this mountain of a God-man. And under his holiness and his glory, we shrink. It's difficult for me to continue to be an angry, ornery, arrogant man when I have encountered the God of the universe. I had a conversation with a professional wrestler one time. And uh, we were talking about, I like that. You have no idea where the story's going. Uh, but uh, some, something was said about somebody being big. And this man looked at me in, in, the, in the, the group and he said, once you've met Andre the Giant, he said, size is irrelevant. Once you've met someone that big, everything else pales in comparison. I don't know if you've ever stood beside somebody either because of their physical stature or their position in life Maybe it was just somebody that was powerful or something and you stood beside them and you just felt incredibly inadequate. Y'all just understand that we are invited into a relationship with the God of the universe. He invites us into prayer. He invites us to know him and he calls us his friend. There should be an inadequacy that comes with that. But that inadequacy comes about as we seek to grow, as we seek to progress in the Christian life. If you're going to pursue meekness, you've got to be honest about who you are. You've got to seek progress in the Christian life, and you've got to live like Jesus. I brought this sweatshirt. I had to go find one in the children's building. Jesus doesn't wear this sweatshirt. Um, But uh, I, um, I, when I, when I, when I have to, I coach Little League Baseball. And I say when I have to. In other words, when there aren't enough dads to handle the thing, I, I step in. I'm, I'm a terrible baseball player. I, I think I mentioned that sermon recently. And so I feel bad coaching kids because I'm afraid that they're going to be worse as a result of my investment in them. Uh, but I do it. And uh, if I'm going to do it, I try to do it well. 
And one of the things that I'm pretty passionate about once the game gets going is umpires. And um, maybe y'all have met those officials. They, they have a really difficult time seeing sometimes. And uh, um, so I am I'm at a baseball game. Sloan was on the field. And somebody got a hit. Sloan was on base. He rounds third base. And he steps on home plate. And about the time he steps on home plate... The catcher catches the ball, and he reaches down to tag, but Sloan's standing on home plate, and the, the, the umpire says, out. And I'm standing in the dugout, and Sloan's standing on home plate, and Sloan gets tagged, and he calls him out. And suddenly, I was no longer in the dugout. I was out of the dugout, right? And, and you know where this is headed, or where I was headed. I was headed to home plate. Um, and as I progress towards home plate, There were church members, by the way, who were present for all of this. It was phenomenal. As I progressed towards home plate, I began to explain to this umpire that the problem was in his ability to see. And I was being as politically correct as I possibly could be, but he says to me, he says, his foot wasn't on the plate. And I say to him, I say, yes, sir, I understand, but he has two feet and one of them was on the plate. He said, he's out, coach. I said, this makes absolutely no sense. And somebody outside the fence, who was my daughter, says something along the lines of, great job, pastor, you being a really wonderful example. (laughs) And I bring this because this is the sweatshirt I was wearing. Not this particular one, one much larger. That says, kids on the hill. You know, and then on the back, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. That's right. Do y'all know why we bought these shirts? Because we looked at our children. This is no lie. We looked at the kids and the teenagers we have in our church, and we said, there's such a good representation of what we are. This is cheap advertising for us because they love Jesus and they represent us well. And so we bought these shirts. And as a matter of fact, Rhonda told me she's, this is the last one I think was just given out today. I got to give it back after this is over with. Um, so we, we bought them about, I don't know, a year or two ago. And, and we've given a bunch of them out for our kids because they're such a great commercial for our church. They're such a great representation. And the pastor is standing on the baseball field wearing this sweatshirt arguing a call. I had deacons there. And they loved every single minute of it, y'all. I think there was somebody, I'm not lying, I think there was somebody visiting in the early service who was there in that game, and I didn't use this sweatshirt, and I wish I had, because, I mean, what a story, right? What does that have to do with living like Jesus? Part of living like Jesus is being willing to be seen as weak. Y'all, I am your pastor. It is one of my greatest joys in life. But I occasionally, regularly, often need accountability in my life to help me to pursue a life of meekness and gentleness. I need to wear that sweatshirt regularly so that I look down and see it emblazoned upon my chest to remind me that I am to be gentle like my Savior. Listen, weakness, excuse me, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is the willingness to be seen as weak. Jesus was not weak, yet he was willing to be perceived that way because he had greater ambitions And his greater ambition was to glorify his Father in heaven and to redeem us from our sins so that we might live with him forever. Living like Jesus means willingness to be seen as weak regardless of how strong we may be. To be seen as dumb regardless of how much we may know. To be seen as a poor leader regardless of how many times we've led. It's a willingness to be seen as less So that Jesus can be more. The kind of meekness that Christ calls us to is is the, the meekness of a prize fighter that gets slapped in the face and turns around and walks off. Not because he has to for his own personal security, but because he wants to for a greater purpose. 
And this is a meekness, a gentleness that all of us are called to. We have to live like Jesus. And we live like Jesus by being willing to seen as weak. And we live like Jesus by, willing to be, by, by willingness to live in the moment for the future. And I understand that that doesn't make perfect sense yet. So y'all just work with me. In the moment, there are things that we desire to do. But to do so would be detrimental to our future goals and plans. Jesus writes here, or he says here, and Matthew records for us, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. There's actually debate among scholars about exactly what this means. When he says the earth, does he mean that they will inherit the physical land, the promised land right there in, 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 in and around um, Israel? Is that what he means? Is this, is this simply just about the, will, the ability to inherit sort of success in life? Or is this eschatological? That's a big word that means it's end times. This is about the ability for us to inherit eternal life with Jesus. In the promised land that's promised to us when Jesus returns to bring his bride home in the book of Revelation. It could even be that it's a little bit both and. That if we are willing to follow Jesus in this life, we're going to find joy and satisfaction here. And we're going to find joy and satisfaction in the life to come. I, I tend to believe that's what Jesus meant. But I know this. I know that we are making decisions in the moment, not because of how it's going to impact me now, but because of what I'm going to receive or experience as a result of it in the future. There's a discipline that's involved with our willingness to be meek. I don't do it because it feels good. I do it because it's right and because it honors my Lord, I have to be totally honest with you. This is a challenging sermon to preach. It, it, in, in many ways, it would be much easier for me to just preach one sermon on all the Beatitudes and y'all just drink out of a fire hose and we give everybody a high five on the way out. But it would be far less challenging for all of us, far less challenging for me as a preacher and far less challenging for you guys as you experience and encounter the Word. Because the Beatitudes weren't given to us to be consumed as a fire hydrant. They were given to us as a reminder of what it looks like to live as a follower of Jesus. And so ultimately, the application point of this message is very simple. Are you willing to be gentle? We live in a world that is not. We live in a world that has lost gentility. It's not exactly a word. We live in a world that's lost gentleness around every corner. I'm, I'm amazed. I am amazed at how harsh language has become in professional settings. That, that, that blows my mind. It, it's incredible for me to see how angry TV personalities are. I tried to listen to a podcast this week and the, the, the guest on the podcast who was invited there to share his wisdom couldn't even get his words out because the, the host continued to interrupt with arguments. We're not gentle. We're just mean-spirited. We're angry all the time as a culture. And Jesus is calling us to something different. And some of you are sitting there and you're saying, well, Craig... If I, if I adopt that pattern, I'm just going to become a doormat for everybody. I love it when people look at me and go, Jesus didn't call us to be a doormat. What if there are occasions where he did call you to be a doormat? Are you willing to be a doormat if it brings him honor and glory? That's not natural, and it's not easy. And yet I don't find an explanation here. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth if they're just meek some of the time. Or if they're just meek when it's easy. 
if they're just meek when the pastor's looking, or if they're just meek when their mama's looking, blessed are the meek. So that's it, really. Are you willing to be gentle in a world that is hard? And just to be totally honest, sometimes mean. Are we willing to look dramatically different for the cause of Christ? There's just no easy way around it. If we're going to live lives that bring honor and glory to Jesus, we are going to have to look incredibly different from the world around us. So I invite you this morning. Husband, today could be the day that you need to repent of just how harsh you've been with your wife and your children. Teacher, today could be the day that you need to repent of how harsh you've been with your students. Boss, today could be the day that you need to repent of how harsh you've been with your employees. Parent, could it be the day you need to repent of how harsh you've been with your own kids? A spirit of gentleness is what we've been called to. It's what we've been invited to participate in. So this morning as we sing, if you'd like to come and pray, we'd invite you to do that. If there's anything I could pray for you about, I would be honored. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and all this just doesn't make a lot of sense to you, but you know you need more than this life has to offer. Nothing would give me greater joy this morning than to introduce you to my Lord and Savior. As we sing this morning, would you come pray with me? Father God in heaven, I thank you so much for loving us. I thank you for your word that never returns void. God, I pray that you'd help us to be meek and mild, be gentle and lowly as our Jesus. Help us to be willing, Lord God, to be different from the world around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand with us. Thank you for joining with us here online at Malvern Hill Baptist Church. We would love to get to know you better and to pray with you. If you would like to be contacted for prayer or to find out how to become a follower of Christ, or maybe you just want to find out more about Malvern Hill, please fill out our connection card online at www.malvernhill.org slash connect. You can also go there to our website. You'll find a lot of information about our church. There's sermons, there's resources, there's other tools that can help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can even give to the work of ministry right there from our website. Thank you so much for being here with us. We hope that you can join us in person very soon. But until that time, I pray that God would bless you in this week as you seek to honor Him with your life. I hope to see you soon. Have a great week.